Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. If someone said to you that they could help you make sense of dollars and cents, what would you say? You'd say you want to join them. Well, I have Jeff Happy Day Pasternak, and you've probably heard of Jeff. He is a he is a happy person, but he's been in a lot of businesses here in Boca Raton in this area. And he is the CEO of Pasternak Associates, LLC. And it's, it's so much more than just an accounting firm or a bookkeeping firm. I think it's just joyful, Jeff. I mean, you make it joyful, don't you? Yes, we do, Anita. Well, you know, at Pasternak Associates, you've heard our tagline, we help people make sense of their dollars and cents. What I've really come to learn over the years, when mom started this practice 42 years, 43 years ago in Washington, D.C., what she hammered in on was the humanist side of the money. Money's very easy in bookkeeping, accounting, and tax. These are easy things. There's numbers, there's boxes on forms, the numbers go into there, and the computers make sure that we've done the math right. That's easy. The hard part to all of this is coming up with the human emotions behind it because emotions drive the reason why we work. The emotions drive the reasons for perhaps why we marry someone or divorce someone or, gosh, a case that we just had come down was uh, 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 OBGYN uh, far up north uh, has a stroke. And everybody says, oh, my gosh, have we looked at the will? Is he going to live? Is he going to die? Nobody knows. But everybody realizes that nobody knows where all the wealth that he's accumulated is going to go. It turns out that when he created the will, he had one son who was a bit of a pothead and was still in college and experimenting with all the great things that college allows us to experiment for, and another kid who was a straight-A kind of a kid. And in the will, uh, they said that, well, the the pothead kid, uh, he can't get any money until he's 30, and that's part of a spendthrift trust, and the other kid can get all the money right away. And uh, now it's been 10 years since that document was drafted. The kid who's a pothead is a dot-com millionaire. And the other kid, well, he found cocaine, he found a divorce, and his life completely collapsed. So being in touch of the emotional need at the time when the will was drafted was really one all about, you know, protecting the money uh, from the kid who was, you know, using some drugs. And then no one looked at it again. And so when I was flown up there, we flew in and out in one day up to Albany, what we really came across was that, wow, here's a guy who made an emotional decision on one side and then had 10 years of life pass him by. And now at the other end, the emotional needs are no longer there. No one was paying attention to his his existence, to his will, to his long-term care insurance, all the money things that go on that people make emotional decisions about once. They need to check up on them each and every year. And that's kind of the level of of work that we do with our clients. We crawl around inside their headspace, see if the financial decisions they made a year, two, three years ago still fit the emotional circumstances of the day. Well, that's an excellent um, uh, explanation. I was wondering, but they have uh, some sort of a lawyer too, I guess, who you have to go to and you work with. That's correct. So we don't do law. We're not lawyers. We don't write wills, estates, or trusts. However, all of those things have significant tax planning issues. Uh, If money is going to pass from one generation to the next, well, was the guy super wealthy? Is there a generation skipping tax? Is there, uh, you know, what are the estate tax issues, if any? Or what if he survives the stroke, which he has, but now knowing that he's on a a much shorter clock of life, maybe he should begin some planned gifting and take care of the grandchild and do some other things to move the money out to eliminate any kind of estate tax issues. Again, is there a money issue at play? Certainly. But it's all about the emotions. Does he love his grandchild? I don't know. You'd like to think. But tap into the emotion and let people start to to get their emotions out allows me to do a much better job of working with a team of professionals that they already have to get the rest of the planning done. Now I can see why the name Making Sense of Dollars and Cents is a very good logo for you. Oh, love the slogan. People grab onto it once they realize. I mean, you buy a house two times in your life, maybe some people three or four, and they buy a condo near the end or what have you, but, but you only buy it a couple of times. But you probably put in a kitchen and you put on a roof. But nobody ever tells them, gee, if you keep those receipts, you're going to get a tax deduction when you go to sell the property. 
or uh, I was with a, a guy. He's putting in a, 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 a he's a he's a flooring specialist, and they own a flooring company. And I said to him, "Gee, you know, as a service measure, you could always ask each of your clients would they like a second receipt to send to their accountant, so that the accountant can keep track of all these heavy duty expenses to reduce the basis that they ha- or increase the basis they have in the property to reduce the tax that they'll pay later when they sell it for a gain." That's so perfect because that happened to us. We did keep everything. Bill had a wonderful file with all the receipts, and that was asked of us because of the, the tax capital gain that we made on our house. And But nobody really normally would tell anyone that. And so when you have a client, you have like a shopping list, it sounds like to me, that you want them to adhere to, and, and then you just keep um, seeing them. How often do you see a client? Uh, most of our clients I'll physically see anywhere in the country at least once a year. If they're in one of our hot spots like Washington, D.C. or California, I may actually see them two times. Why is that a hot spot? A uh, it's where clusters of our clients are. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. I thought you meant yeah, because I mean, the laws uh, change in those places. Uh, no, it, it's really uh, about a third of our practice is in Washington, D.C. or it's you know the Washington, D.C. Metroplex. We have Metroplex. We have another chunk in Boston. We have another chunk in the – uh, L.A. metro area, and then a couple scattered around. So uh, I try to fly around the country to all of our clients. Uh, I was in Oregon this year, uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, next year, uh, actually, my son and I are doing a round-the-country road trip, and we're staying at all of our clients' houses all around the country. Well, he has <laughs> a great son, Jake. I mean, I have to tell you, that is that is one unforgettable kid he is really what a pleasure you're very lucky on that one well yeah yeah that's i don't take any credit for that i think i did half the first job of the first moment of it and then dana took over from there and uh, ran the way but you know the the i think because we're a, a low volume high touch kind of a practice it affords me the opportunity to talk with our clients on the phone at least and but email you know three four five times a year Anytime they're looking at anything, whether it's an insurance policy, one guy called, he wanted to know where he should dock his boat in the Chesapeake Bay. Should he keep it in the South River and pay $150 more a month, or should he go over to the West River where he can save on the monthly dock fee? And uh, he's got a 40-foot boat, and the question really isn't, should he dock in the West River, the South River, and the 150 bucks? The guy sneezes and 150 bucks falls out. I mean, most of your audience, their cell phone bills, 100 and whatever dollars a month. The answer for him was really about where do you go to get your crabs? If you like your crabs at Mike's Crab House in the South River in Edgewater, then yes, you stay on the South River because you're going to spend more than 150 bucks in gas getting there. And if you instead like it over at, uh, I forget the place in the West River, but there's another crab house there. And if you prefer their, they call them crab bombs, like the size of a softball with almost no filling for their crab cakes. But if you like that kind of crab, then you don't, you know, then go to the West River. Don't worry about the 150. That's the cost of the gas. So I see. I see (laughs) when you first got on the show, I realized what you're saying that it's really a people business. It isn't a money business or accounting business. It, It it is, but at first it's who are these people, and then you know how to uh, fix. You're going to have forms anyway, but now you have to know how to fix the forms so it's best for them. Right. I wanted to ask you a little bit of a history of your mom. She sounds like she's fantastic in what she started and why she started the business. And So, you know, this is kind of a, you know, you have to go back to the mindset of the early 1970s. Mom was the first woman to graduate red gown, meaning top three of her class at, at the University of Maryland. She went on to become the youngest female CPA in the state. Uh, And when she was interviewing for jobs, uh, it was a male-dominated industry. And so many of the men that were interviewing her had a casting couch. I'll let you think about what that means. And mom has a lot of pride, married. The last thing that she was going to do was jump on the casting couch. So she decided that she would, you know, the heck with this. She's not going to do that. She's going to open up her own show. And now, your your father, though, he had his own business? Yeah, my father's a psychoanalyst. And, so uh, he was able to right, have yeah, her do that. Well, yeah, that, but, but really what she began to do was to get involved in all the mom kinds of things and the social things that happen in Potomac, Maryland, which is a sleepy suburb of Washington, D.C., and the women that she was meeting were the wives of congressmen and Supreme Court justices and, and getting involved with them socially. And there's a great line from that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, right? Men are the head of the household, but women are the neck and they control what the men see. 
So in the 70s, all these politicians and lobbyists, they're all fussing around. You got Watergate, you got Vietnam winding down, all this exciting stuff. The men don't have time for silly things like taxes. That's a woman's job in the house. So mom began to collect all these female clients and uh, and build a practice. It became one of the largest all-female accounting firms in the nation. She was the National Organization of Women's uh, Businesswoman of the, of the Year. And uh, along the way, I think what really kind of gave it a massive jackrabbit start along in her practice was uh, one day a guy who was in the House Ways and Means subcommittee, and they go through a lot of the tax issues, and he comes home, and, he, and he's talking to his wife about this tax bill that they're considering, and she says, well, why don't you ask your accountant? And the guy's like, well, who's that? So the long and short is that the, that the, that the congressman and a, a campaign manager and a page came over with their three tax returns because that's three different wealth classes, three different income classes, right? The page is the low-wage person, campaign managers, middle America, the congressman with all his stuff, which mom already had those returns. And so they did all three returns before the law and all three returns after the law to see what a practical effect would be on a human's taxes. And all of a sudden, that blew everything up. And uh, and it was fantastic. And uh, we've gone on a, a commissioner of the a sitting commissioner of the IRS was a client for many years until his term was done. And uh, she became the accountant to the DC stars. And uh, along the way, she uh, focused on this humanist approach. It's not about the tax return. It's about all the different financial hats a person wears. So take yourself, Anita. You're a business owner, which means that you're an employer. You probably run some sort of pension fund, although you don't necessarily think of your retirement plan that way. You have that. You're certainly a healthcare manager between yourself and Bill. And when you had the kids, you were all those hats. I mean, people wear so many hats, a grandmother, they're a parent, all the different financial hats have all different kinds of needs. And so if we can tap into what those emotional needs are for every hat that our client wears, then we're able to help them with the tax and the planning and all these pieces. We don't touch the money. I don't tell you to buy GE and sell Ford or things like that. But we're certainly part of the discussion of which, how do you feel if you hear on the radio that the market dropped 1,000 points today or is up 500 points tomorrow? Some people get really jazzed about that. Well, those people that get really excited and anxious about it probably should have a different risk profile than those that don't. Now, I don't tell the guy at Morgan Stanley or Ameriprise or whatnot. I don't tell them what to invest in. I just help have the conversation of these are the emotions that this person feels when she's watching the market go and or fall and you know take that into consideration when you uh you know place your trades very similar to again we don't sell insurance but i have those really uncomfortable discussions my favorite question anita what happens if you get hit by a bus and live because getting hit by a bus and dying is easy Uh, your will takes over your estate plan takes over everybody's sad sure but when you get hit by a bus and live with a slappy slack face and you're you're half crippled that's really hard because very few people have disability insurance or they might not have enough disability insurance or enough other family support or friend support. And certainly there's very little government support. You could get $1,100 a month from SSDI. Who can live on 1100 a month? It's a brutal number to try and squeak out an existence on. So I have these uncomfortable discussions about that. Um, here's another fun one for you. I know you're going to love this. So uh, husband, 77 Wife is 70. Wife, not in such great help. Husband is in fabulous health. So the wife says to me, Jeffy, uh, she calls me Jeffy. I don't know. Anyway, so she says, Jeffy, if I die before my husband, I want him to find love again. He's only 77. He still drives at night. He, you know, has a good time at the prescription counter at Walmart. You know, he's going to be living a lot longer. His family lives longer. But my family dies in their mid-70s. I want him to find love again. And if he decides to marry a chippy who's going to chip away at the money that they've built up over all these years, then she says, that's fine too. But when he dies, if he gets buried with his new wife and put in the mausoleum there, I want you to take my body out of the wall at the, over here in Boca at the gardens. And there's $25,000 set aside to move my body back home so I can be buried next to my mother. 
I, I can't believe this conversation. And, and so, so people feel funny about it enough that she's taking twenty five. It costs about twenty thousand dollars to move a body, but you know, uh, so so this is purely an emotional thing, but it has a financial effect. We're going to pull twenty five grand out of her, uh, you know, out of her estate when she dies to fund this trust. And this is what she wants. This is all about emotions. It has nothing to do with Does her husband, 000. has he ever heard this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, because knows. it's part of the estate plan. And this so, is very interesting. So the know. lawyer f- puts this all down as a document, but you you know where the money has. Yes, you have to save that $25,000 somehow, right? Yep. She's got to sequester it off into a trust that will be created when she dies. Now, you meet with your estate attorney maybe three times a year. Maybe people, or not, I'm sorry, three every, once every three years, once every four. How comfortable are people with their estate attorneys if they even keep the same one? So, but they tend to keep the tax guy around, you know, the, the the happy-go-lucky accountant guy. And so, you develop the relationship where these uncomfortable things can come up. I'm just, I'm <laughs> shaking my head. This is so funny. I mean, I knew that you should be on Comedy Central. I've always felt that <laughs> about you. But I, you know, when you became now the um, the CEO, CEO of this of wonderful accounting firm, uh, the Pasternak Associates, I uh, and do we call it an accounting firm? Yeah, yeah, okay, we're okay. accounting. Plan. So now tell me, let's go back to your mom. So are you? You have brothers and sisters. Yep, I have a younger brother, and <laughs> as my grandmother once said, "That's okay, Jeffrey. At least you have your looks." Because he went on to get his PhD, and he rebuilds rivers and all this intellectual stuff. So what stuff happened and- though is, so your mom had two kids, and um, and she reared the children as well as was a mom, you know, and 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 a businesswoman. So it sounds like she's really done an excellent job. So then you're doing your own businesses, you're traveling all around, you're having a lot of fun. And what was it that made the decision for you after you had sold your last business that you were to do this with your mother? Well, when uh, I guess if I think back, our punishment as children was to go to the mom's office and to insert the tax rules into the books. And then our continuing, for which we were then paid three bucks an hour. Then our continuing punishment when we got to be 12 or 13 was, you know, mom would go around and get uh, she, she worked at places that featured dancers of negotiable affection. And uh, so those businesses all run on cash. And so she would have cash receipts and all kinds of receipts piled up in shopping bags, if you remember the 70s and the 80s. And so what better thing than to have your kids sort them by expense type? And then it was to enter them into ledgers. And eventually, you know, that you know, we grew out of that kind of thing. Our own lives started by the time I was 17. I was a regional manager of a chain of gift stores. But in every business, bookkeeping, accounting, and tax reign supreme. You can't buy more inventory unless you have sold the inventory that you have. You can't open a new location for a medical practice until the old location is spinning off enough profit to fund it. So bookkeeping, accounting, tax have run through every single business I've ever been involved with. And having grown up in the space, it was a very simple thing that after I sold my last business to go back to the old family business. And uh, I spent two years uh, studying to become a certified financial planning pr- uh, professional. Uh, most grueling exam ever. It was two days of brutal questions. It was fabulous, but very, very difficult. And, and, and your uh, mother was really open to this because your mother, would she like to retire? Yep. Yeah, well, yep. So she's retired four times. Uh, she sold the practice three times and swore she was retiring each time. And every time she would do it, the clients would come kicking down the door and make her go back to work. So in uh, 2000 and uh, well, I guess really in the late 90s when she sold it the third time, they all came kicking back. She told them that we're done with fancy offices, that send everything to the house or we'll come pick it up, but done with you know the, the ideas of offices and things like that and, uh, and no more secretaries and things and rates go up. You know, the fees are not cheap for high-touch service. And the clients didn't care. They just knew that they wanted a Pasternak helping them take complex issues – break them down into bite-sized pieces so that actionable steps could be taken. And uh, the practice stayed pretty steady from really the you know, early 2000s all the way up until 2010 when uh, when uh, I started to come on board. And, but now uh, your mother has been – she lives up north or she nope, lives she's down here? she's here. Because yep, I know moved I down her, here. So she, they did move down here. Yep, so they Is moved she, down. We moved the practice with her. And, uh, and then in 2011 she said she wanted to start to retire again. 
And did I want to take this over and make another run at it and build a new version of Pasternak Associates? And so, sure, But you had the personality also, like, you know, exactly what you're talking about. That's who you are. You are an in-depth person. You have to know the person or you don't want to do anything. And so this is always, even when you had the junk business, I mean, that's how you did things. I remember going out and getting ice cream for some of these people who you go to pick up your their junk. No, you're a you're a unique individual. And so when you decided to do this, then you so your mother must be very happy because it sounds like you're really growing the business even more than she did. Uh, well, it's a different kind of growth, you know. So in the beginning, you know, go back to the 70s or the 80s or early 80s when she was getting it up and off the ground, everything was different then. I mean, she had to combat the glass ceiling of women in business. And uh, so she was able to go after you know other female business owners and the wives of all of these senators and such, and built a practice that way. But you know, down here in South, and so so up in Washington, our practice still consists of people at World Bank, uh, some other dignitaries and functionaries and lawyers and such. And down here in South Florida, our business is really broken up into two pieces or two segments. The first are people between the ages of 28 and 35 who have broken away from their law practice or their dental practice and are starting out on their own. Uh, They need all kinds of operational support. And because I've owned lots of different businesses and built a chain of medical centers and done lots of things, I'm not just an ivory tower accountant. I have like real world experience. You know, Uh, we bring a different brand of, of consulting to them than what they could get from someone who only has done accounting all their life. So young folks that are building up a business for the first time need a lot of guidance, and we provide them with that. The second cluster of our South Florida clients are people who have located, relocated down to here, and they want that face-to-face contact with their accountant. They might love the guy in New York or the gal in Philadelphia, but that person's probably 70 also and is winding down their life, and they want some fresh eyes on their things. And maybe they own a couple rental properties, and they have some complex investments that have some weird tax things. And so they want that face-to-face communication uh, you know, to, to come and work with. And uh, in fact, when we were uh, when I when we threw our client appreciation event uh, two weeks ago, um, yeah, and I'm sorry, boy, it was just. I guess I was still recovering from the expo. Yes. I looked at my calendar and said, "Oh, I missed this. I couldn't believe it." Uh, Leone, so sorry. I know Leone came by, and Leone oh. did such a great job with the expo. And so, one of our guests was a 75 year old woman whose husband had died a few years earlier when they were up in Delaware, and she had relocated down here and was referred into us. And, and so she came up to me at the party, and, and she took both of my hands, and she said, Jeffrey, I've had accountants for 50 years. Not a single one has invited me anywhere for anything at any time, much less come over to my house three times for my coffee. <laughs> and uh, she says, I, I, you know, I'll never go anywhere for as long as I die. You're my accountant till the end. And, uh, you know, and, and that's great. I mean, when, when people appreciate high touch and they – you know, people go to Saks Fifth Avenue for a reason here in Boca. We're like the Saks Fifth Avenue of accounting practices. Well, and of course, I'm staring at your tie. Did you have that made to order? Y- you know, uh, a client brought this in. I um, mean, this happy day. This tie is gorgeous. It's blue. He has a blue shirt on, and it's a blue tie with white, pretty little flowers. But it has a smiley face, and that's Jeff. It's always been a smiley face. It's always happy day, uh, and you know, and... And and I can't get over that. So she found that somewhere. Yeah, Is that your only one like that? Uh, actually, no. I, I have a yellow one. This one, a client went to Hawaii and brought it back for me and because uh, they saw it in the store. And they said, oh, that's course, perfect for of Jeff. Of course. And uh, I have coasters. I mean, everywhere the clients yeah, right, see right. Happy but Day, the they tie, send me that's texts. Your, that, that's good. Um, and so you, uh, yes, you know, I would know that about you, that you're very good in the community. This is what you, you understand. And business is you know, it's important, but it needs to have all those other peripheral amenities. So I have to tell everybody, Jeff has been the best volunteer that we have ever had for any of our events in our big boomer expos. Jeff is there whatever time early in the morning he's there and he's guiding the exhibitors in. He's helping people. He just does everything. And it's always, yes, I can. You know, that, that's really your motto. You're never... You're never um, dismayed or 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 uh upset about anything you always make a as we say you turn lemons into lemonade is this something that you learned from your mother 
and uh, your father? Well, from both of my parents, I think that, and somewhere along the way, we get instilled with a sense of national pride, right? I am an American, right? <laughs> I'm an American. Yeah, I'm a citizen of this nation. Of course I can do, right? It's in the name of our of how we refer to ourselves. I so, never thought of it. That. It's like yeah. nutrition, nutrition. You see that new th- that yep. advertisement? I Absolutely. never saw it as a nutrition. And now you're saying, saying American. I never saw that either. Yeah. Thank so, you. you know, it, it's, <laughs> if you make it a habit of getting things done, then people gravitate towards that. And so, yeah, that came, you know, I, I think everybody had a, well, maybe not everybody, you know, the mother, father, grandfather, someone in their life always stepped forward and said, you know, if you think you can, then you can. If you think you can't, then you can't. And so that positive mental attitude that, you know, that, that, just kind of got sparks and then uh, uh, music played a big part in all of this as well uh, you know for for my happy day attitude but uh but it's infectious and now in, in our family we call it the happy day magic and uh you know if i can just help you know one or two people smile at a moment when they might not have been thinking it then that was a win for me that is so great and jake your son he really is a um, I mean, I don't, and I don't know your wife that well, but I know that he's very much like you. I mean, he has this wonderful, beautiful attitude. What do you think he's going to do in his career? Uh, well, hopefully he'll stop driving his mother crazy. Uh, you know, he's learning to drive right now. She puts her head in the oven every time he walks out the door with the car keys. But uh, right now he's very interested in sports journalism. He covers uh, locally, he covers major league lacrosse. Uh, over at uh, Florida Atlantic University, and he's the beat writer there. And then uh, he also wrote a couple of articles for the Dallas Mavericks uh, for their fan page. It's a uh, uh, NBA basketball team, and he really enjoys sports journalism. And uh, while a lot of sports journalism has been taken over by computers that write a lot of the articles, anything in depth or dealing with emotions and judgment calls are still done by humans. And so, uh, right now, at the age of fifteen and a half. Yeah, he wouldn't mind staying in that. He is. He's uh, such a a lovely young man. And, of course, I always look at kids in a sense. You have to look at the parents and you always wonder where there are a lot of kids who uh, a lot of kids who don't have the parental guidance that you had. But thank you, Jeff. It's been wonderful having you on our show. And uh, happy day, Pastor Nack. And let me give a phone number here. If you want to call Jeff, you call him at 561-235-2829. Or you could go to taxbypa.com. So that's 235-2829 or taxbypa.com. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. Keep on smiling.